decided to write this book because after spending most of the last decade traveling around the country to dozens of cities, meeting hundreds of entrepreneurs, I found their stories so mesmerizing and encouraging that I just wanted to share them with other people. I think most people assume most of the innovation is happening in places like Silicon Valley and don't really realize what's happening in dozens of cities all across the country. In terms of the forces that are converging, uh, obviously the pandemic has been a kind of shake the snow globe moment in terms of people rethinking how they work and where they work and how they live and where they live and remote work. A lot of things are happening that is resulting in, in a dispersion of, of talent. People that left certain places, there have been a brain drain are now returning. There's sort of a, a boomerang. So that's a, a factor. Also, as the internet shifts and starts dealing with some of the most fundamental aspects of our, our lives, how we stay healthy, how we move around, things like that, you start disrupting some of these big industry sectors, uh, it's going to require partnerships, collaboration, not just the technology. Technology is almost the table stakes. It's the partnerships you bring around them that are, that are so important. Uh, and many of the cities in the middle of the country have the expertise in things like healthcare, whether it be Mayo Clinic in, in Minnesota or Johns Hopkins in Maryland or the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio or United Health in Minnesota or HCA in, in, in Tennessee. So those are the partnerships that likely will be pivotal. So having companies closer to those companies and, and potential partners is going to be a, a key advantage in, in this next wave. Also, we're seeing you know government at, uh, at both a national level and at a local level kind of lean into the opportunity in different ways. A lot of people have been working on policies at the at more of the local level, creating angel tax credits, things like that, trying to build innovation you know, districts. Uh, and you're also seeing a lot of work, in, including just this last few months, at the federal level, some of the legislation that has passed, including the CHIPS Act, that funds the development of regional hubs, tries to fund more of the industries of the future. So it's kind of a moment in terms of what's happening also on the public policy front. And finally, there's, there's a level of collaboration focus on startups that really didn't exist before in most of these places. Before the economic development game, game plan was, how do you get a big company to move? Or how do you get a big company to move, open a factory or something? Now they recognize it's the, really the new companies that are going to be the sustainable you know, job creators. So that's happening as well. So each of these things are developing. We've seen the you know, uh, growth in these rising cities over the past decade. The data in terms of the last decade is in 75% of venture capital has gone to just three states. You know, California, New York, and Massachusetts. So the other 47 states have been fighting over that remaining you know, 25%. That's starting to change. 1,400 new regional venture firms have started in the last decade. Uh, the venture capital dollars flowing to the entrepreneurs in these rising you know, cities in the middle of the country are up sixfold over the past decade. So that kind of bodes well. And we are also seeing some of these breakout successes. Uh, a company like uh, MailChimp in Atlanta just got acquired for $12 billion. So probably the most important health tech company in the country is a company in Madison, Wisconsin called Epic, which does most electronic medical records for, for most of the hospitals in, in the country, or Carvana in Arizona, now worth $8 billion. So there's some data point that really is showing this is happening. Every year, CNBC comes out with what they call the Disruptor 50 list, the company's most likely to really disrupt industries, create significant value in terms of what they will be worth, create significant jobs. Uh, and for the first time, uh, about two thirds, 33 out of 50 of the companies on that disruptor 50 list were from outside Silicon Valley. What's happened just in the last few years because of the pandemic and how it's shifted, how people think about work and, and remote work, whether it be big companies or small companies, is really amazing. And for decades, people have talked about video conferencing. It was only when everybody had to shut down that everybody embraced Zoom and other video conferencing technologies. And they realized it worked pretty well. I realized it gave people more flexibility in terms of kind of where you work, allowed companies to access talent all across the country and not force them to move to their, their headquarters you know, city. And it gave people uh, an unusual level of flexibility. I think the next phase is going to be interesting. Some of the larger companies, particularly some of the big banks in places like New York, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, have really said we do need people to come back to the office. Part of our strategy to hire young people and train them, mentor them, and it's harder to do that in a in a in a more remote kind of world. So there will be some companies that that do that. There will also be some companies that really are designed to be remote only companies where they have a completely dispersed workforce uh, and are, are do not have any uh, headquarters, if you will. Most companies are going to be somewhere in the middle. I think this is going to be super helpful, maybe even transformative 
in terms of what's happening with the rise of the rest will be frank, a little bit confusing for a lot of people, a lot of you know, companies trying to figure out what is the right policy? How do you balance the, the desire to give people more flexibility while also getting the benefits of collaboration, creativity, mentorship. We've moved away from the, the, the point where people said that you can't participate in the innovation economy unless you live and work in Silicon Valley. I think now we're moving into an era where these rise of the rest cities will uh, continue to rise. Indeed, probably this will end up being a tipping point. And over the next decade, we'll see an acceleration that we wouldn't have seen uh, but for the pandemic. I stumbled onto this about a decade ago when I was asked to initially co-chair the National Advisory Council on Innovation and Entrepreneurship, which led to an initiative called Startup America that was asked by President Obama to chair. And then I was on his Jobs and Competitiveness Council, and we actually worked with the McKinsey Institute. They did a lot of uh, work analyzing different options. And the startling statistic, which I was unaware of at the time, and most people were unaware of at the time, really builds on your question that while small business is very important, in so many ways, the fabric of our communities. And we saw the challenge that small business had during the pandemic when, when sadly many shut down. And big business, our, our most successful companies, our Fortune 500 companies, also obviously very important. Neither sector really is a big net job creator. That most of the net new jobs come from new companies, companies less than five years old, startups. So we have to back startups all across the country if we're going to create jobs all across the country. And that insight is becoming more and more clear at the federal level, the city and, and, and state level. We've seen the benefit of that focus just in the last few months. Some of the legislation that has passed Congress, been signed into law by President uh, Biden, uh, does focus more on uh, investing in regional hubs. It's clear that even looking at the politics right now in our country, there are a lot of people in the country that are feeling frustrated and kind of left out, left behind. They, they're seeing the innovation happening in places like Silicon Valley and people there doing really well. Some of that innovation leads to disruption of jobs in their own community, sometimes in their, in their own families, which obviously makes them not just frustrated, but, but angry. The only way to deal with that is to back more new companies in these communities that can create some of the jobs. So this idea of the rise of the rest is not just about backing entrepreneurs and trying to have more entrepreneurs in those communities. It also, I think, is a national priority to really make sure we are creating a more evenly dispersed innovation economy that does bring more people and more places into the future, allows them to be part of forging uh, the future. Another area that's quite important, uh, it's been discussed in, in Washington, D.C. now for well over a decade, uh, is immigration reform. Part of the reason we do have the leading economy is because we've been a magnet for people for, for a long time. We want to come to this country and, and build the future. And some of our most successful entrepreneurs have been immigrants from other other nations. But in the last decade, we've made it harder for people to come and harder for people to stay. As a result, some of the people that would have started companies here, that would have created jobs here, are starting companies elsewhere. So it really is time to pass immigration reform that allows us to win what is now a, a global battle for, for talent. So some of it is about just focusing on startups, recognizing the role of, of new companies, some of it's focusing on creating a more dispersed in, in, innovation economy, including a, a regional strategy, sort of a place-based uh, policy. And some of it's also making sure on things like immigration, we really are kind of winning this next battle. What gives me hope is as we've traveled around for the most of the last decade uh, and now visited, you know, more than 40 cities invested uh, through our Rise the Rest uh, seed fund in over 100 different cities, we're just seeing remarkable stories, remarkable companies being built there that are leading these communities to reimagine what's possible and create opportunities that otherwise wouldn't have existed, building on some of their uh, legacy industries. For example, in, in, in Chattanooga, we backed a company called Freight Waves uh, that's building a platform for the trucking industry because most of the big trucking companies are based in Chattanooga and they're benefiting from policy at a local level where over a decade ago, the, the mayor led an effort to build what was the highest speed fiber connection in the country. So that suddenly advantaged you know, Chattanooga and, and gave people a reason to to be there. We're seeing in places like Detroit, companies like Shinola and StockX starting to, to, to scale up. The other reason is when particularly on these bus tours, uh, we, we invite a lot of people to join us from the universities, from you know big companies in, in that particular uh, city, as well as mayors and governors, senators and so forth. Uh, and when we're traveling around, 
everybody's united in really believing in the, the role the entrepreneurs play in driving creation of, of new companies and jobs. It's not a partisan issue. I saw this a decade ago when I worked on the Jobs Act, the Jump Starting Our Business Startup Act. That passed Congress with broad bipartisan support. So there are many uh, aspects of, of politics these days that do divide us, uh, sadly. Innovation, entrepreneurship, job creation, uh, trying to make sure the United States continues to be the leader of the world in terms of innovation, entrepreneurship. That is an area that does uh, does uh, unite us. And sure, there are going to be some challenges in some areas, including some of the recent decisions on, on some social issues like the Roe decision around abortion that could impact how some of the talent flows, the people that were thinking of moving to a particular place might uh, rethink that. How do you get people who want to come to your city, that want to come to your state? So there are some aspects on, on uh, politics at, at that level that also need to you know, get a lot of tension in the years ahead. Globalization has had a lot of impact in, in a wide range of industries. It's also impacted entrepreneurship. But uh, if you look at the data 30, 40 years ago, over 90 percent of global venture capital went to the United States. Now it's under 50 percent. So we have seen the globalization of entrepreneurship. Many other countries have figured out that the, in some ways a secret sauce that made America America is innovation, is entrepreneurship. And they're trying to you know, win this you know, in terms of these uh, industries of the, of the future and, and have policies uh, that really create the right environment for the entrepreneurs in their countries to, to succeed. So that should be uh, recognize. We're also seeing uh, the, the, the need, and we saw more of this obviously during the, the pandemic, uh, to have your supply chains closer to home. But because of automation, things that before were outsourced to other countries like China now are being you know, brought back to the United States because you can create these uh, these different different products with, with fewer people, and therefore it becomes more economically attractive while at the same time having more control over those supply chains. And the, and the legislation that recently passed uh, you know, Congress around the CHIPS Act really highlighted the strategic imperative to make sure as a country, we have more control of things like our semiconductor pr production, as opposed to just relying on other places to get more technologies that really are central to many industries that are being kind of reimagined. So there's a lot of dynamics at the global level around entrepreneurship, around uh, supply chains. Part of that story, though, is the story I'm trying to tell with the rise of the rest, what's happening within the United States. While we're seeing the globalization of entrepreneurship, we're also seeing within the United States the regionalization of, of entrepreneurship. And dozens of cities, hundreds, thousands, really, of entrepreneurs are really reimagining the American innovation economy. I do think there's an opportunity for it to be much more inclusive bring more people, more places uh, along, uh, which will maximize the likelihood the United States does continue to lead the world in terms of uh, innovation and entrepreneurship, and also does maximize the likelihood that we have a more inclusive innovation economy that really does you know, make more people feel good about the future as opposed to anxious about the future. So that's why I wrote the book. It's, I think, an exciting time for innovation in America, not just in places like Silicon Valley, but in, you know, in cities and states all across our, our great nation.